in GYC. Yeah. We will now sing, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let us stand together as we sing, The Lord is in his holy temple. Shall we rise and stand together? Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Loud him, all you peoples. For his merciful kindness is great towards us. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath, GYC. Bon Sabbath, GYC. I would like to pray with us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for your loving kindness towards us. As Father, we're about to engage in a divine service. We pray, Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to move in this place, to call us to a higher calling, Father, and may our hearts be changed so that we will never be the same again as we come closer to you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Happy Sabbath. And good morning. Is God good, GYC? Amen. I want to extend a specially warm welcome to the, uh, those of you that were not here with us through the week. We're so glad that you were here with us today. We wish you could have been here with us uh, throughout the entirety of the conference. It has been such an incredible blessing. Um, I know I myself have been personally impacted so much. Um, but we're glad that you're here, and we're, we're really thankful that you can be here with us over the Sabbath. Um, as our divine service is beginning... I want to read Psalm 100 to you. You can turn there in your Bibles. It's short, um, but I think it encapsulates the essence of what we want to do over the divine service. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, GYC. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Welcome to GYC. And I'm also very blessed and privileged to have on the stage with me Elder Gabriel Maurer. He is the secretary of the Inter-European Division. Uh, Elder Maurer, thank you so much for being here and welcome to GYCD as well. I wish you a wonderful Sabbath and that each of you will have a personal encounter with Jesus today. Amen. At the beginning of these meetings on Wednesday night, 
the president of the Austrian Union has welcomed you. Today, I'm glad to give you greetings from the inter-European division on which territory we are. I bring you the, greeting, the greetings from my colleagues and in a special way from our president, Brother Bruno Vertalier. I'm really impressed and glad to see so many young people dedicated to God and his cause. How many people did Jesus need to turn the world upside down? Twelve. We are many more than twelve here, so I think that God wants to do something great in our days. I'm so pleased to see that you have so many creative ideas. I'm so pleased to see the many ministries you have started and others are thinking to start ministries. I would like to encourage you because our church still knows why God has put us in this world. We are here because we, are, we have the task to communicate, to share, the good news of the soon coming Lord. Here I have the missionary book for next year, Health and Wellness. And we need bodily health and wellness. We need also health and wellness for our mind, but most of all we need spiritual health and wellness. At the same time, I think while we are trying to share faith, it's also important that we grow in faith. So mission and spiritual growth goes together. And here I have a new, one of the newest books of the Ellen White estate. It says, Help in Daily Living, from the book Ministry of Healing. I think together, spiritual growth and mission will bring success. Personally, I like very much the passage from Daniel chapter 3, 16 to 18, where three friends, they say, our Lord can deliver us from this fiery furnace. Our Lord will do something for us. And then they say, and if he will not, we will not bow our knees. I would like to encourage you to stay firm with the Bible and spirit of prophecy. I would like to encourage you to stay firm with our God, with Jesus Christ, whatever will be in this world. God needs young people who want to give testimony by their lives and by their firmness. I would like to encourage you. And don't forget, God has his 7,000. He has people who believe. And he has many people outside the church who would like to come inside. So I would like to encourage you. I would like to thank also the president of GYC and the whole team for having organized this for the Austrian Union and for all the people who came here into the Austrian Union. God bless you. We will pray for you. And uh, we are looking forward for the great things God will do in Europe and maybe further than the borders of Europe. God bless you. Thank you, Alder Maurer. Welcome to GYC. GYC, this is a very special moment in our worship service. Are you excited? Do you know what's coming? As the ushers are coming forward and getting prepared to collect the offering, and the choir is coming forward to share a wonderful song with you, I'd like to take you to a Bible passage in the Old Testament. And I can't do otherwise but think of that passage every time the offering is being collected at my home church. Please open your Bibles with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 24. And there you read, it tells you about a story about a very young king. Let's pick it up in verse 4. And it says, And it came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. This young king named Joash, as he was ruling in his kingdom, he saw a need, a great need that the temple needed to be rebuilt. Brothers and sisters, this conference here at Linz in July 2014 would have not happened without young people unhindered young people that had the desire and that saw the need, the great need of revival and reformation here in Europe. And this, this conference would have not happened without you answering and, and following that calling and coming here to this conference. It says further, so 
King Joash, he saw the great need and what, what happens. In verse 8 it says, And at the king's command they made a chest and set it without at the gate of the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation through Judah and Jerusalem to bring into the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. What a brilliant idea. What a brilliant idea. It must have been in inspired. On your seats you have found an envelope. And I want you to pick up this envelope. And if you open up this envelope, you have the opportunity to support DYC through your offering. And I have a special portion on this envelope. It says that you also have the opportunity to give a pledge. Because in 2 Chronicles 24, it says, and let's read it in verse 10. Maybe you can read it with me, with your Bibles that you have in your translation. It says, and all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought in and cast into the chest until they had made an end. Do I see, are you rejoicing this morning? Are you happy to be here? Happy to be here and ha to have the opportunity to give something back to the Lord. We read further, now it came to pass that at, at what time the chest was brought unto the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and they, when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest's officer came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to his place again. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. Brothers and sisters, GYC is not just a conference. It's not just an event. It's a movement. And you have, if you have felt the desire and if the Lord has placed upon your heart that you should um, support GYC, through a weekly or maybe a monthly offering, I'd like you um, to put this on and write this on your envelope. Now, as the choir is starting to sing this song, it's based upon a passage in scripture in Micah. And please open your Bibles with me to that passage. And as the choir is singing that song, I'd like you to ponder upon the words in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to eight because we are able to give our offerings to God that is true but what God is truly looking forward to is our heart and so the question is have you given him your heart today and as we sing this song I pray that you will recommit your life to him and that you will say yes Lord I want to give you my heart my time my talents my resources everything should belong to you
Let us stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, everlasting God, with what shall we come before you is our question this morning. And we want to give you our hearts, our lives, our talents, our time, our resources, everything that we have. And as we've now collected the offering, we just pray that you will use it mightily in, in your ways and you know where, where it's needed the most. I just pray a blessing upon this Sabbath day and that we will see you through this service in a better, in a better way. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. Please remain standing. Today's scripture reading is found in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, 28, verse 30 and 31. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence unhindered. May the Lord add a blessing to his word. You may be seated.
Weren't we blessed by this beautiful choir? Amen. Thank you so much for these beautiful songs. We want to welcome Pastor Jerry Page, who will have the sermon for the divine service. He has been serving in, uh, for the Lord for over 30 years, and he's now uh, the Ministerial Association Secretary as, at the GC. But he did not come alone. He brought his wife, Janet, of course. Oh, no. Amen. Pastor Jerry Page, yeah. this morning we just have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Um, the first one is, when you're not working at the GC office, what are you doing? There is no other time. No. <laughs> uh, our family loves to walk, to hike. We love the mountains. I grew up in Colorado, so we, if we can, we'll be in Colorado for a little while in September, and we'll be up in the high mountains. We love to backpack and hike. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, the second question that we have for you is, what is your vision for the Adventist youth around the world? <laughs> oh, my vision, I'll talk about that in the message, how about that? But <laughs> my, my vision is that every one of these young people would have such an experience with God, be so filled with the Spirit that the book of Acts will look like a prelude to what he's going to do. That's, that's the real goal. Amen. We'll Amen. be praying for you as you Amen. present the message today. Praise God. God bless. Thank you. Well, happy Sabbath to you, I see. You're up. <laughs> Janet and I have been praying about this. We're excited about it. It's so good to be with you. We have uh, a lot of our prayer partners around the world praying that the Holy Spirit will be here today. And he is here, amen? We've asked for that. And so we're looking forward to our time. It's a real privilege to be here on this Sabbath with you and an honor. And I hope you'll pray for me as I try to share some things this morning. I like it when Janet's by my side. We share together sometimes, but today it's me. But we've just come from Indonesia, where we were with the Indonesia Youth for Christ. Amen. Last Sabbath. And what a wonderful uh, few days we had with those young people. God is on the move with young people around the world. Amen. We believe it's the Malachi 4, 5, and 6 movement, the Elijah movement, right? Just before he comes back. And uh, the fathers and the children, the young people getting together, our hearts bonding as one, us responding to Elijah's call to get out of Baal's land all together, amen? So it's been a joy. We've, we've had so, such good time with you. We were at Youth and Mission. We were at ASI Scandinavia. We've been uh, some other things here in Europe, and we are just one of the things that excites us the most in the world today, in the church, looking for his last great revival, is this movement, the movement of young adults on fire for God, uh, willing to hear the truth, willing to follow inspired writings, willing to do what he needs done. So. Thank you for being here, and uh, we just pray that the Holy Spirit will do what he wants to do in our lives today as we move into these next few minutes. Would you just pray with me silently? And I'd like to invite you to just ask the Holy Spirit to whisper to you whatever he wants to today. Uh, his message to you may be totally different than what I say. Uh, he has something very personal for you. So let's give him permission. Luke 11, uh, Jesus said the Father always wants to give us the Holy Spirit and his message, his ministry. So would you just give him that permission as we begin? Lord, we are so thankful that you humble yourself to be in this place with us, to love us. We're so glad to be Christians today. What a joy that brings to know that we're in you and we have eternal life waiting. And uh, we're just waiting for you now to speak to our hearts. Please get me out of the way, Lord. Uh, come and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Early in my ministry, I was at a, in the Rocky Mountain Conference in the Rockies in Colorado went up to a minister's meeting at the lodge in the mountains. And uh, Janet wasn't with me. There were two beds in the room. And in the other bed was the educational leader for the conference, Bob Rice. And in the middle of the night, I had one of those dreams. It was so real, I was sure it was happening. Do you have them like that? Virtual reality. And in the middle of the night, I dreamt that it was my wife, Janet, in the other bed, not Bob. And I got up in my sleep and I began to sleepwalk across the room towards poor Bob, thinking it was Janet. 
And I ended up standing right over him in my sleep, looking down at him in the darkness of the night. And just then, I decided I better get in bed with her. So I began to climb into bed with Bob. <laughs> that woke Bob up, woke me up. It was one of my most embarrassing moments in life. But Bob, he's got a great sense of humor. He said, Jerry, I won't tell a soul. <laughs> and I said, Bob, I'm going to tell everybody before you get a chance to tell it your way. That's what I did. I gathered all the pastors at breakfast, and I told them about my sleepwalking experience. You know why I share that with you this morning? It's because as I look back over my life, and it's getting to be more and more years, I realize how often I thought I was awake when really I was asleep. Do you hear me, GYC? Jesus in his mercy, isn't he great? He just loves us so much. He pursues us all our life. And with me, he's constantly trying to wake me up. I look back to the beginning when he first waked me up, awakened me, but constantly he's after me. He's pursuing me, saying, Jerry, you're falling asleep again. Wake up. Be what I want you to be, what I plan for you to be, all the joy, all the power that I have for you. Uh, Romans 13, 11 and 12 says this, and do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Me and technology, here we go. Pray for me. When I first woke up. I was a preacher's kid. My mom was an elementary school teacher for the Adventist Church. They were so busy working for God. I really appreciated that message last night, some of the calls that, that we made decisions on, all, all of us. They were very busy for God, but somehow I grew up at home watching TV and didn't get in on the literature evangelist rallies. My dad was a literature evangelist leader. Didn't get in on some of the other things they were doing for the church. And so, my mom, who was a precious lady, she loved me, but she did not have assurance of salvation. She uh, really didn't think she was going to be saved. She didn't believe God could love her because she was too bad. So I grew up with mom at home. Dad was out on the road a lot. And what happened is uh, I knew about rules. I knew about how the church should behave, but I didn't know about Jesus. I didn't get introduced to this wonderful Savior who wants to be my friend, who loves me, who has a, a great life ahead for me. And so I had a real burden to be unhindered. My burden as I grow older was to be unhindered from a life of excitement, adventure, and fun. Hey? And uh, so I headed down the road of trying to find that without knowing about Jesus. And it's a sad story. I won't waste a lot of your time this morning. But I ended up one of the most rebellious kids. I was proud of it. I, I wanted to, everybody to know that I didn't want anything to do with God. I tried to flush my Bible down the toilet at one point to prove a point. Got kicked out of three of our academies. My parents, I, I, they loved me. They were doing their best. Dad was a very grace-oriented man, but he was on the road all the time. And uh, every time they kicked, I got kicked out of one of our schools, they said, now, Jerry, which Adventist school do you want to go to next? So it kept me in the culture. It kept me putting seeds in there. I was getting seeds all the time in my life. Thank God for the promise that says, train up a young person in the way they should go. And when they're old, they can't get away from that training. So farther I got down the road, I just wanted out. I wanted away from the church. I wanted away from the rules. You know, there is a principle that says rules without relationships leads to rebellion. You know that, don't you? If we don't have that love relationship with Jesus, which is what it's all about, eternal life, uh, we will begin to rebel eventually too because just doing, just having the rules, as important as they are, if we don't have the relationship, it doesn't work. So I wanted out. Finally, I got to live with a bunch of uh, friends downtown Denver. We were buying and selling drugs. We've been taking them a long time. We got into a very dangerous kind of lifestyle. I was taking school, looking to be a lawyer, had a pretty good job and was making some money. But uh, we were doing some pretty dangerous things. The treasurer's son was killed in a drug deal up near Estes Park in the mountains. Uh, we began to sell cocaine on the back streets of Boulder, Colorado that we had stolen in another place. And so I had everything I'd wanted. I was free. But you know what happened? The reason I share that with you this morning, partly, is because many of you have loved ones that you're praying for. My parents made some mistakes, but the one thing they didn't 
do wrong is when they saw how far gone I was, they got everyone they possibly could praying for Jerry. <laughs> all the literature evangelists, all the people in the center of the United States that were friends of theirs, they had praying for me. They prayed me miserable. Hallelujah. And so while the other kids were enjoying the drug trips and all, I was becoming more and more unhappy, more and more miserable. And one Saturday after a long, bad drug trip, my girl and I were sitting in our apartment. We were talking about how much we hated people, how much uh, everybody seemed to be cheating us and be so selfish. And why were we so miserable? As we talked, the Holy Spirit came in and just reminded us of those seeds. My parents had been praying so much that we would have our eyes open. And that night, we realized the people who'd loved us, the little lady that brought food from the apartment or from the church to our apartment, the Bible worker that had come to try to win us. They were all Adventist Christians, so filled with love no matter how we treated them. And so that night we decided maybe what would make us happy <laughs> was love. We decided early in the morning, the Bible worker said it was 3 in the morning, we called him. He'd left his card with a number and said, hey, we're ready to start studying the Bible. We started going to their little church, and I tell you, their little church there in Denver, Colorado was on fire with love. They, uh, we came out of the rock music scene our long hair and beards and the whole thing. But when they saw us, they just loved us, wrapped their arms around us. And if we didn't come to the Friday night small group, they were on the phone, where were you? And they pulled us in. If we didn't come to church on Sabbath or the Saturday night social, they just loved us and loved us. I hope your church is like that. If you love people, that's Jesus. And Jesus will draw them in. And after a few months, we were rebaptized. I thank God for him saving me just at the last minute. We were getting ready to start using needles. As I said, one of my friends was killed. We could have easily lost our life. But God has let me be a pastor, be a leader in his church. And I say, isn't he wonderful? <laughs> isn't he gracious? And no matter how bad any of you may feel this morning, as you know your own sinfulness, you know some of the things that go on in your life that nobody else can see, perhaps, I just want to, to let you know this morning that if God can use me, if he can save me, and use me in his kingdom, if he can use David after what he did, Moses, after what he did, uh, he can use you. He let them write the Bible after murder and adultery. So God has a great future for each one of you. But I also want to say, don't quit praying for all those people around you, brothers, sisters, friends, your parents perhaps, or a spouse that aren't really converted, don't really know Jesus, because there's something about united prayer that opens the power of God in the universe. The great controversy has rules, and one of those rules is that when we pray, he's able to do things he can't do if we don't pray. So I urge you to follow his commands, two or three together. Pray intensely. Get more and more people praying if your kids haven't come back yet. Your grandkids are still away from Jesus. He will open blind eyes. The promise is my parents claim, Isaiah 42. He will set the captives free. He will make the crooked things straight. He will uh, contend with the one who contends with you, and he will save your loved ones. So whatever hurt there is in your heart about someone that hasn't come back yet, this morning, I just want to encourage you, pray more than you've ever prayed before. And then I went to Andrews the next uh, fall, cut my hair, and God was so good. The minute I walked on the campus, somebody came up, found out I was going to take theology, happened to be the leader for all the Christian ministries on campus that year. And he said, hey, we're going out. A bunch of groups are going to do evangelistic meetings out in little churches. We'd like you to coordinate that. He didn't know who I was. Isn't God good? He took this leader for bad and turned me into a leader for good, even though I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I hope you're getting involved, because that's what really helped me get assimilated and, and saved and in the church in a, in a powerful way. But now I want to take a little different turn this morning. As a young pastor, I wasn't even sure before I went back to Andrews that I ought to go to school, because I was so sure Jesus was coming soon. Do you believe Jesus is coming soon? I didn't know how long we had, but wise people said, go ahead and prepare. You have an opportunity. You have the money. Go to school. Be trained. And then Jesus will come when he comes. And they pointed out Ellen White's statement that if we're in training, when he comes, it's the same as if we had gone out into the field. So I began to work. But I've had this question in my mind for a long time. When will he come? And you can see it's getting longer, right? <laughs> and I want to take you to that for a minute with me this morning. Um, a young man loved to drive his sports car fast in the curvy mountain roads. He loved to feel it, just grab the road and hold on. But one day as he was driving, he came to a curve he couldn't see around. And uh, all of a sudden, a woman driver came around that curve out of control. And uh, she almost flew off the cliff, but at the last minute she steered, came back straight at him in his lane. Looked like it was going to be a head-on. 
He was panicking, but at the last minute she went around him, and as she went flying by him, she yelled out of her window, pig, at him. He was enraged to think that this woman, and I don't know how it is here, but in America, if somebody calls you a pig, it's not a flattering term. He was enraged to think she was in his lane, almost hit him. Why would she call him a pig? He was thinking, what can I do? So he called her another name in English, hog, another name for pig. He was feeling pretty good. He thought of something to call her, went on around the curve and hit the pig standing in the middle of the road. I like that illustration because it reminds me of my God. My God always sees around the curve, amen? He knows what's coming in your life. He knows what's coming in this world. He's given us, he's given us a warnings. He's yelled pig at us through the scripture, the prophecies sometimes. Wake up, it's time to wake up. Your salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Yeah, it's true, it's time. Sometimes he comes through friends and tells us things we don't necessarily want to hear. Other times he's just speaking to our conscience through the Holy Spirit. But every time that he says something of warning to us, it's like the lady she was trying to help, right? She wasn't being nasty. She wasn't yelling a threat. Instead, she was trying to warn him what was coming. That's our Jesus. He's always trying to do that for you. This weekend is a wake-up call for all of us. It's a warning again. In the Chinese language, they say that there are two picture characters, you know, for the word crisis. You know what they are? Danger and opportunity. And that's true. Every crisis, every big crisis has danger and it has opportunity. Uh, you know, the 2008 financial crisis that started in the U.S. and went around the world. Uh, the new president and his chief of staff said, we must not waste a crisis. <laughs> because every time there's a crisis, there's opportunity, right? Some people lose money, some people have trouble, but others who know are wise and know how to plan and, and have some, some capital stored up, they make a lot of money. So every time there is a crisis, there's danger and there's opportunity. I believe with all my heart, and I'm here with a burden this morning, strong burden, passion in my heart, that we are in a real last crisis. Do you believe that? That we are in the last great crisis? Do you believe? Is this just, again, a bunch of young people? We're thinking, well, Jesus is coming soon, and, and so, uh, you know, just like Jerry did 30, 40 years ago, whatever it was, whenever he was young, thought Jesus was coming soon. Well, it may be another 50, maybe another 150. How long will it be, huh? I know Sebastian said last night, we don't have to preach on the signs here. I agree. You know the signs of the times, don't you, Matthew 24? We're going to see natural disasters. Are we seeing a lot of those? We're going to see political chaos. How many countries are blowing each other up and threatening nuclear and everything else? Yeah, that's there. Politicians don't know how to handle it. And then we see all kinds of things in the religious world. Uh, as Janet and I travel 200 days a year, 200,000 miles every continent, we're seeing the, the amount of the world that is covered with false religion, false Christ and the false prophets, Hinduism, and Islam, Buddhism, all of these things are so controlling in so many places. The devil has stolen the march. But in the Western part of the world, uh, what about secularism and postmodernism? You know, we can talk about all the different ways. But have you noticed what the papacy is doing lately? Got to at least touch on that quickly, hadn't I? Have you already talked about it some this week? I don't know. 2008, when the financial crisis happened, the Pope had just, in the last couple of years, put out an encyclical on the Sabbath saying that we needed to get back to keeping the Sabbath. You know about that. But then in 2008, he said, what we need in the world with this financial crisis, we can't seem to handle the finances, we need a moral and religious power to take over the world economy. Amen? Who do you think they've offered as <laughs> the possibility for that? Have you read Revelation 13 lately? That is an economic crisis, isn't it? can't buy or sell. They have actually put out their resume why the Vatican would be just the right ones to take over for Wall Street that's so greedy and selfish because they care about the poor. And we see the new pope and how everybody is saying, what a great guy he is. And you know in the last few months about the stretching out of the arm of Protestantism across the Gulf. You've heard about that. Yeah, this bishop, uh, Anglican bishop who's Pentecostal, who is a uh, friend of the new pope, was a former Jesuit priest, and he, they reached out on the phone to uh, Kenneth Copeland, big convention of Pentecostals, evangelical Christians here in, in the United States, and the Pope was saying, come on back home. <laughs> We're really all the same. And, and this bishop, Tony Palmer, was saying, you know, we need to put aside doctrine. God will straighten that all out when we get to heaven. We really need to go home. And he said, you know, the protest is over. 
Time for us to all get together, unite together. You know what Ellen White said on that? When the Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the Gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, charismatic, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is very near, Christian service. 160, 161. So we are at the end. What about our Adventist church? What we find around the world is there are wonderful Christians. There are young adults like you that want to, really want to serve God the way they should. But we also find that every culture, no matter whether it's a persecuting culture or a materialistic culture, or wherever it is, Satan has his plan to suck us all into the local culture. Amen? Amen? Amen. He's got a plan to draw all of us into our local culture so that we have one foot in the culture and one foot in the world, like Baal in the time of Elijah, huh? That's what's happening. So the, local, the, the Adventist church is definitely part of the Christian movement. We are Laodicean. I'm a recovering Laodicean. How about you? God is helping us. He's trying to turn us around. But I want to focus now on the last two great signs in the time I have left, the last two signs, and say what's happening there. Look at this one with me for a minute, if you will. This is what Ellen White said is the last deception to come on the earth. She says, the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 28, 29, 18. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. Is that happening? To make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God, the Bible, and the Spirit of prophecy? Is there a plan to undermine our confidence in them? Huh? The whole Christian world really doesn't believe in a seven-day creation week anymore. Adventist Church is the last one, well, most of us. But some of our professors, some others, have become convinced that uh, that isn't really true. You need to, theistic evolution is what you need, something like that. The last deception we make of none effect is none effect always an attack? How else can we make a none effect the Bible and the Spirit of prophecy? By letting it just sit there? While we in our busy lives ignore it? While the Spirit of prophecy is not read in depth and the Bible is not studied as it should be? Because we're so busy. So busy maybe doing good things. The statement goes on. Why is this Satan's last deception? Because then there'll be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, which is satanic. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them for this reason. Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. In the spirit of prophecy, God gave us a lifetime prophet. And don't you love her? She is so balanced. Her message of grace, her message of salvation, along with the honest truth from Jesus, he sent her to tell us the warnings, to say there's a pig in the road in our lives for the church in the world today. Thank God for the spirit of prophecy. I urge you, as I heard Pastor Gabriel saying earlier, stay faithful. There are many in the church that don't want to hear the spirit of prophecy anymore because it cuts across, because it says pig to us on things that we like doing. But God is calling us to that. But now I want to go to that last one in Matthew 24. Can you say it with me? This gospel of the kingdom, are you awake? Shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then what? The end will come. How are we doing on that one? If we believe Jesus is coming soon, and we see all the other signs are fulfilled, sin, we don't need the world to get more sinful. None of these other signs, they've all been fulfilled. So what is, what is, how are we doing on the last one in Matthew 24? The gospel to the whole world. How are we doing on that? We had a conference last fall at the general conference, and I thank God for our leaders there, Elder Wilson and Elder Finley. They love what you're doing too with GYC around the world. It's a wonderful movement. We praise God for it. We had a conference, though, called the Urban Mission Conference at the general conference and called in leaders from around the world. 25 years ago, there was the Global Mission Conference. You may have heard about it. They looked at all the unentered territories in the world and said, how can we 
how can we intentionally seek to reach into these territories? We've got to finish the work. We've got to go over the last hill. We've got to get the, the gospel to everywhere in the world, every nation, every person. The facts came rolling in in that conference. But before I say that, how, how have we done as an Adventist people? You know, after that disappointment, we had these poor, uneducated group of believers. Once they came to understand the sanctuary message and the power of, of God's word and the prophecies, God said to them, okay, now you got to take this message to the whole world. And they headed out. How's it going on that? That's what I'm asking. Do you know that every 28 seconds somebody's baptized as an Adventist Christian around the world? Hallelujah. Yeah, every two and a half hours a new church is planted somewhere in the world. Praise God. Over 3,000 people baptized as Adventists in the world every day, usually on Sabbath, but that many a week. Hallelujah. We are in like uh, 202 countries out of 100 and, or 232. Uh, we're in 927 languages, over 18 million members. God has done amazing things through this movement. We praise Him. We, everywhere we go, we're amazed. Dan and I were in the heart of Congo, in one of the most uh, isolated, undeveloped areas we've ever been in, riding along in an old UN four-wheel drive. The guy said it'd be three or four hours. It turned out a 20-hour trip to get to where we could fly back from meeting with some precious people there. We, we, the thing broke down. The front-wheel drive broke. We were in a little village, several hours to jerk it out, and then we were a two-wheel vehicle. But uh, during that time, a couple of the Congolese men said, hey, let us take you up the road here. There's, some, uh, there's an Adventist church up there, we think. So we walked up this little road, tiny village. Sure enough, pastor's daughter came out to meet us, took us to the little church. Behind it was a little school. Everywhere we go in the world, no matter how isolated, we find there are two powers there. <laughs> the Adventist message, a little clinic, a little school, a little church, so many places out there. Same thing with the Catholic church. They're there. This great controversy is wrapping up. Amazing things have happened in the world. Uh, over 18 million members. But how are we doing? The, st the stats came rolling in at this Urban Mission Conference. What's going on? And let me give you just a few of them briefly. For the first time in human history, more than half of the global population now lives in urban areas. By 2050, it's expected that 70% of the world will live in cities. There are more than 500 cities with a population of 1 million or more, 236 of which are in the 1040 window. You know where the 1040 window is, right? Northern Africa, the Middle East, India, China, the toughest areas of the world with these other religions that are oppressing and, and keeping Christianity out, if possible, in every way. We also heard that these 500 cities of over a million have an average of one Adventist congregation for every 89,000 people. It includes 100 cities where there's less than one Seventh-day Adventist for every 20,000. Includes 45 cities with fewer than 10 Adventists. Includes 43 cities without even one Adventist congregation. We began to be a little sobered by some of this information. The big cities of the world is where over half of the people live now, and they're moving there every day by the thousands into the cities. So how are we doing in the cities? Well, we're there, but it hasn't been our brightest result so far. So in that meeting, inten intentionally, we plan that in every city of over a million, there will be a specific plan to reach that by next fall. This next fall, the plan will be in place. Uh, in MENA, that terrible union there with the Middle East and Northern Africa, they have planned to reach every city, have a plan in place already, but they're going to need a lot of help from us. So we began to be sobered by all of that information that was coming in because, what does the last sign say? This gospel of the kingdom will go to the whole world and then Jesus will come. We can sit here and say he's coming soon, we can be excited about it, but how long will it be? How long will it be, GYC, until Jesus comes? These figures give us a sobering challenge, but they also help us see the tremendous opportunity that we have lying just before us. Uh, as we looked at some of these facts, as we wrestled with them, a seriousness settled over us all. Are we doing everything we can to hurry the coming of Jesus? What is going on there? When will he be coming? Homer Tricartan came to the mic the, the new union president, the general conference has taken the Middle East under them directly so that uh, every division can work for them. He came, he said, my brothers and sisters, the challenges are awesome. Ankara, Turkey, 
No Adventists, really. Five million people. He said, what I need in the Middle East are bodies. I need young people. I need, I need people who will come and live in this dangerous area, perhaps risking their lives. It may be a martyr's call, but will come and live. He said, you can send me money. I can't, pre I can't get big evangelistic meetings. That's good, but I need people, people willing to come. Homer said he went to River Plate College down in Argentina. He said, I was preaching to, to the student body there. I got kind of excited. I started telling them uh, of this need. And then I felt the Holy Spirit was urging me to make a call. So he said, I, I made a call. I said, you know, this really is a martyr's call and for some of you. I need people that will come and just live in some of these countries in the Middle East. Would you, would you be willing, some of you, to come forward and to say, I'd be willing to go. If God calls me to go there, I'll go. Do you know 200 young people came to the front to that call? I get excited about our young adults today. I see that same thing with you. You're willing to go wherever God calls you, willing to do whatever he asks you to do. I text my own son some of this information. He's come back in a major conversion the last few years, is now pastoring in California. God's really been working his life. I praise God for what he's done for him. I text him some of these sobering facts. I said, Zach, pray for the Middle East. Pray for these countries. He texts back. He said, Dad, I have a suggestion. He said, send all the associate pastors in North America to the Middle East immediately. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Thank God for the army of young people he's raising up, willing to do whatever needs to be done for Jesus. The South American Division has already sent 10 young people to Kyrgyzstan. They're living there now. They've made a, a way now financially paying for them, but they're paying for 25 pastoral couples to go as missionaries. The whole church has got to come together. We've got to use all the resources to reach these areas. But the point remains, when we look at these challenges, how long is it going to be? We just had 150th anniversary at Battle Creek, 150th anniversary of this church. Should we rejoice or should we weep? Jesus said he could have come in the 1800s, right? He could have come in the 1850s, we're told. The revival started, but people got a little tired. It didn't happen fast enough. The latter rain didn't come quick enough, so they put their foot back in the world, and Ellen White says, we missed the window. 1888, same thing. A new revival came. We could have gone forward then, but we turned back. 160 years. How long will it be? Are we going to be here another 150 years? <laughs> GYC, are you going to roll off the thing with white hair like me? Huh? I was in Tanzania about a year ago. I was talking to three or 4,000 leaders there. And I said to them, they were pastors, elders, deacons, deaconesses. I, I suddenly said to them, I said, my brothers and sisters, we're wondering how long is it going to be? I said, if, God forbid, we'd never want this to happen, but say that Barack Obama was assassinated today, how long would it take for every villager in Africa to know? What do you think? What would you say, GYC? Some amazing, amazing event like that in the world happens. How long would it take for the whole world to be talking about it? What do you think? The African leaders said, one of them said, two days? <laughs> Another said, no, no, one day. Others said, hours. Shortwave radios, most of those pygmy villages we rode by. How long would it take, brothers and sisters, Adventist friends of the remnant, how long will it take for the three angels' messages to be on every lip in the world? How long? If that's true, and Jesus wanted to come a hundred and some years ago, why hasn't he come? Why hasn't he come? He's longing to come. His heart today is longing to come back and end all the suffering and the trafficking of people. What, you know, I heard you talk about the whole list terrible things in this world, the disease, the dying. He wants to come back. Every sign is in place. Communication is in place. The social media, all of that. So what is Jesus waiting for? What is he waiting for? It taunts me. What is it? I believe, my message this morning is final breakthroughs. I believe that God has given us some amazing promises of final breakthroughs. But it's based on his people that he loves dearly, that he's waiting on to answer those several calls, to get serious about them, 
to really do it, not just talk about it, not just discuss in Sabbath school, not to do a little of it while we're doing something else, but to put our lives into those last calls, huh? You may have some different ones than I do, but I'm going to just in the last five minutes share with you what I believe they are. Look with me. First of all is the cities. We've been told this, so this is a wonderful promise. The work in the cities is the essential work for this time. When the cities <clears throat> are worked as God would have them, the result will be the setting and operation of a mighty movement such as we have not yet witnessed. Better than Pentecost, amen? When we work the cities as we should. Now, we can talk about every village in Europe too, every neighborhood. South America is dividing up every neighborhood and sending a, something in there because they have a lot of churches and cities already. We've got to reach everybody, don't we? But cities, we're working on it. Over 500 and some cities now in the world, we're planning, strategizing, but we're trying to work in Christ's way, not just evangelistic meetings, not just a big gospel balloon that makes a big scene, but rather individual Christians ministering, centers of influence. I think of Jakarta, these precious women, some of you know Marlene and Irene, over the last few years, their own sacrifice, their own, their own vision, their own much, much prayer. God has taken them to have four little centers of influence, working for the Chinese immigrants. Health food stores on the first floor. Second floor is classroom. Third floor is a place where they're starting small groups. They've planted three new churches. And the top floor is the most important. It's the prayer room where they pray over everything that goes on in the ministry. God is doing that all over the world. He's raising up people to finish this work. I must rush, rush through these because of time. What was Jesus' method? Luke 4, 18 and 19. He, anoint, he was anointed to preach but to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Christ's method, you know this statement well, our ministry of healing. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good, showed them sympathy, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, then he bade them, follow me. There's a need of coming close to the people by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing, and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. Relieving the sick, caring for the sorrowing and bereaved, etc. Then this, we're to weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of what? Prayer. The power of the love of God. This work will not, cannot be without fruit. Hallelujah. What a promise that is. Billy Graham said it. I believe A.W. Tozer said it first. 95% of what we do in the Christian church today would continue on if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn, and we probably wouldn't notice. Is that a false statement? Forgive me as a leader in this church for many years. Forgive all of us who've tried to run this church humanly, setting goals that we knew we probably could reach, using methods humanly without enough cover of the Holy Spirit and prayer. God help us do something major. In the early church, however, 95% of all her activities would have stopped if the Holy Spirit were removed. I've asked them to show you just a little spot for 90 seconds. It's some new spots, 10 of them we're making play on Hope Channel on 3ABN. But the story of the book of Acts is a story of God's believers in the upper room, uniting in prayer, confession, humiliation, one accord but much, much prayer. Look at this spot for just a minute. It all started in a small upper room with humble, fervent prayer. Threatened by the authorities and banned from preaching, the church prayed and two men witnessed with great power and grace. And people prayed everywhere in one accord, in repentance, with confession and humility, and the lives of people were changed. Two men started out on a missionary journey that would turn the world as they knew it upside down. And the message went out to the world beyond. Corporate prayer helped a prisoner escape. A king requested that his people fast and pray, and the enemy was defeated. A battle won, 
without the need to fight. Through a faithful servant and a young queen's faith and courage, a people were saved. Stories in the Bible showing the power of united prayer. The story of Acts is a story of obstacles being removed when the believers got together, prayed, and fasted. They did every time. Then the Holy Spirit came. The next thing the Bible says is the Word of God went forth with power. Then the church grew dramatically. Over and over, that's the story of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is Joel 2 the first time, right? But God is calling us today. First of all, we're working the cities. We're trying to go with Christ's method. We need to move in that direction. I believe when that happens, the way we've been told to do it, God is going to move in a mighty way and take the, the control out of our hands, and we're going to see mighty things happening. But also, the book of Acts. Don't have time to read all these scriptures to you. You know them. Acts 2, 42 to 45. They met in upper room. Then they met in rooms. They prayed. They confessed their sins. They were of one accord. They believed. They uh, hum humbled themselves, but they prayed much. All who believed, they gave their goods together. They weren't hanging on to things, materialism. And then daily, as they did this, the Word of God went forth. Much prayer, fellowship, one accord, everyone witnessing. We're told that a revival of true godliness among us is our greatest need. This humility, the upper room experience, the confession, the prayer. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. And the last call, I believe, is the book of Joel. You look at the message there about the latter rain. You look at the message there about the miracles that are going to happen very soon. What a promise it is of the final breakthroughs. But he says, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. He relents from doing harm. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children. Let the bridegroom go out of the chamber. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Israel. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? How is it in your church, in my church on Sabbath, when the community people come in, do they say, wow, God is really here? It's not just a nicely run program with a bulletin. It's, there's power here. Lives are being changed. Miracles are being had. Answered prayers are coming. Do they see that? God has said, when we get serious about praying, our personal prayer life and our corporate prayer life, when we get serious about doing that, not just talking about it, discussing it, but are willing to take the time to really get together and pray unitedly, we're going to see the same results that Jesus saw, the same results that Acts saw, and we will see that last great movement taking place in God's church. Young people today, in appeal, I just want to say to you, we need you. We need you to lead us. We baby boomers have been whining about Ellen White. We've been whining about this and that. Been uh, sitting here for years. God is calling for a generation who will get on their knees together, will pray until the power of the Holy Spirit is poured out, and will see the amazing, the amazing promises of God revealed in your lives, in your church. Um, you know, in Europe, I'm sure you're all on fire for God, right? The culture's not sucking you in here. No materialism, no uh, theatrical amusements, no, none of the stuff that tends to draw us in other places, but we know it's not true. God is calling you. He's calling you to know him with a richness in your personal life, but to call the people in your church to something more, something higher. The fighting the bickering, the self-agendas that go on in our churches, you young adults, by living godly, can help us to feel really embarrassed about that, to see Jesus in a way we've never seen him before, to turn this church around for the last great revival and reformation that God is calling for. Passed out some materials, a little bookmark. There's websites, there's helps, there's books at the Army thing you can get on prayer and Bible study. But those are all just tools to help us. The real thing is we just need to do it. <laughs> it's just time to do it and not talk about it. It's so hard. Satan hates it. You know that we're told that Satan's whole host trembles at the sound of fervent prayer. Why is that? Because it's the one thing he knows will suffer loss. He will be killed at that. But as long as we talk, as long as we just keep working, he laughs because he knows that he can overcome us in those areas. 
We need to cover everything we're doing, every ministry, every service, every temptation, everything in our lives by calling on Jesus as he called on the Father, our God, Jesus himself, so much in prayer. It's not the only thing. We need to be involved. Lay involvement, work in the cities, those are key things God's waiting for. Reflection of his character in us, yes. I'd love to tell you lots of stories. We'll do some this afternoon if you come. But I just want to say now as I got to close, please, GYC, don't just come to a nice meeting, go home, keep your hand in the world. The Elijah message is how long will we halt between two opinions? If God is God, let's go all the way with him. If Baal, then let's serve him. I tell you, when we were in the Congo, later that night, we were driving after dark, and uh, some armed men had blocked the road, rifles over their shoulder. And uh, that makes your prayer life come alive, you know? They looked in the vehicle. There was Janet, blonde, sitting in the front seat. They looked in the back, saw me and about eight other Congo guys. We didn't know what they were saying, but we were praying hard. It makes it real. And uh, the Congo, Lee's, a couple of them got out, started talking to them. And they said, we found out later, they said, we want the white people. <laughs> but they said, no, no, you can't have them. Take us instead. And then they said, but you better be careful because these white people are missionaries and they work for God. And they said, oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I say that for one reason. I was a young teenager that thought I was awake. I thought I knew what was fun. I thought I wanted an exciting life. But wow, real excitement comes with Jesus. Amen. The real adventure is when we're with him, saving souls. My son, after he got converted, he was with a girl immoral, and we were afraid he was going to marry her. And I, Long story, can't tell you. But he, all of a sudden, she went off, had an affair with somebody else, and he got converted just before he was about to marry her got on our youth evangelism team, and hallelujah, he's been so transformed over the last five years. It's just amazing. He pushes Janet and I so much because he's got to walk with God. He gets him up two, three in the morning. He spends hours pleading over his people, weeping between the porch and the altar, saying, God, spare your people. Are you willing to pray the price? Are you willing to be part of that last great movement? It's going to take us hanging on to Jesus. He hangs on to us, but we got to hang on to him. We got to say, Lord, help me. Help my friends. Help us to really get together and pray, not just kind of take a stab at it. Because I believe when we answer that call, the last generation to have a spirit of intercession like we've never seen, then we're going to see this promise fulfilled. You know it well. The Lord will be zealous for his people. The miracles will come. The rest of Joel too. But then this one, early writings, this message will close with power and strength far exceeding the midnight cry. Servants of God endowed with power from on high with their faces lighted up, shining with holy consecration, go forth to proclaim the message from heaven. Many were praising God. The sick were healed. Other miracles were wrought. The spirit of intercession was seen even as was manifested before the day of Pentecost. Hundreds and thousands were seen visiting families and opening before them the word of God. Hearts were convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit and a spirit of genuine conversion was manifest. On every side, doors were thrown open to proclamation of the truth. The world seemed lightened with the heavenly influence. Will you kneel with me? Let's just talk to Jesus. We ask him to speak to our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I'm not gonna tell you what to give up or what to do. I know my son, after he got on our team, he met this wonderful lady he's married to now. In his face, when he came back from their first week of prayer, he said, Dad, this is what life's all about. <laughs> Serving Jesus, this is what life's all about. He'd been a crazy extreme guy trying to kill himself in mountains and everything else, but he hung on to a little box from his previous girlfriend of things because she uh, asked him to. But when he asked Leah to marry him, she said, can we get rid of the box now? whatever it is in our life that might keep us from being a part of that last great movement. It's breaking. It's happening. Within a short time, God can take this message to the whole world. Very short. But we have to answer the calls. We have to be on our way. Then he will sweep us up in the Holy Spirit and he will take us so fast it'll make our heads spin. I believe that. It's not far off. All the signs are in place. Just us. He's waiting because he loves us. So you just talk to him, whatever you need to talk to him about. 
it's a confession of sin, if it's a commitment to spend time with him more, commitment to get together and pray with somebody, whatever it is, you just talk to Jesus and thank him that he will work in you to will and to do, to take you where you need to go for this last great revival. There's got to be some here, and I know Sebastian will be making a call tonight. So, I just as we're praying, though, there's, there's got to be some here. There may be some here that won't be here tonight. Just uh, need right now to talk to Jesus about accepting Him, getting on the journey. Maybe you don't know you're saved. You don't know you're in God right now, in His family. If you don't know, would you just make that decision right now? And if you already have, or maybe you need to come back. You know you've really been pretty estranged from God, sort of divorced. You want to come back now. It's time. It's time to get on board, to, to be a, totally with him. Some of you feel a call to make that kind of a major decision, not just a recommitment, but a, a major coming back or a accepting Jesus, planning, preparing for baptism. Would you be willing just now to raise your hand? You're willing to talk to somebody about that and just... Uh, Make a decision for him. Just raise your hand if you're in that group that needs to make a major commitment about coming home to Jesus right now or starting on the journey with him. Just raise your hand if you're in that category. Nobody's looking around. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen, Jesus. Amen. Amen. For the rest of us, God, make it clear to us what we need to do. Call us to be a, a movement with that spirit of intercession. Zechariah 10 says that the, the last movement, when the latter rain comes, will have the spirit of intercession raised up in its midst. Thank you for those that are doing it. So many of our churches are so devoid of prayer, just doing quick prayers and going through the actions and the motions, just like Jesus' day. Uh, help us, Lord. Thank you so much. You're so wonderful, God. Thank you for saving me. Why you let me lead in your church, I don't understand, but I glorify you for the privilege. And I pray these young leaders here, Lord, you'll take them. Don't let them be locked in compromise and mediocrity. Help them to just put out everything in their life, any TV, any media, movies, whatever that is, is taking them away from you, any other sin, maybe addictions or pornography or Whatever it is, God, just rip those things out of our lives. Help us to, to let you work in us to change our very hearts. I thank you, God. I thank you for what you're doing, for raising up this last great generation of youth. We believe you're coming soon, and we want to be a part of it. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you. Thank you for what you're doing in your church. In your name, because of your blood, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Will you stand with me for the benediction, please? Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or pray or think or dream according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world, without end. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Be seated. UIC family, please stand once again and join us in singing our closing song, We Have This Hope. <laughs> 